Chapter 4 Cook County Jail Indictment and Arraignment Saturday, December 23rd, 1978 At 10 o'clock in the morning, a plainclothes officer entered the cell to see if I was awake. He was one of the detectives with the original tailing team and one of those who had promised to take me to visit my father's grave. Are we going to the cemetery today, like you promised? He looked down at me. Yeah, I think they're planning on taking you now. Three officers appeared outside the cell and told me to get my jacket on. We were leaving. The thick glass door to the cold cell opened and one of them stepped inside and handcuffed me. I was led up the long hall to where the interview rooms were located. The bright lights made me squint until my eyes adjusted to the abrupt change from the shadowy cell. The station was crowded with people from law enforcement and the state's attorney's office. Most of them stared intently to catch a glimpse of me, jostling each other for a better view, muttering in low, somber voices while I ushered into a side room. I was still confused and maybe not yet as concerned as I should have been or would have been if it were not for the lethargic aftermath of my long-term use of sedatives. A captain ordered Tovar to take me out to the garage. Let's go, John. This way. Stick close to me. We went to the garage where, on the 13th, an evidence team had ransacked my car for clues. I followed one officer into the back seat. One followed to enclose me. Two more got into the front seat. And about seven others stood guard. The huge overhead door cranked open, revealing a small huddle of the bundled-up curious waiting outside. Probably the media trying to get close enough for pictures. As we inched backwards out of the garage, they were jostled by the vanguard of officers. Hmm. Behind a lead car, we moved as fast as possible down the alley to the street the newsmen scurrying after us with their cameras flashing. When we hit the street, the driver punched the gas pedal, and we moved out like a bullet. By the time we hit the edge of Des Plaines, the lead car had shunted off to one side in order to break up the parade of cars trying to follow. I had been deceived. We are going south, the wrong direction for the cemetery. What's going on? I asked. The court order says we have to take you to Sir Mac Hospital at Cook County Jail. Anyway, look behind us. Do you want those reporters walking all over your father's grave? We can't do it now. He was right. Damn parasites, I muttered like a pack of dogs chasing a bone. <laughs> Tovar said, If you're going to talk in the car, I'll have to read you your rights again. So, during the rest of the ride, there was some small talk, nothing worth mentioning. But during the trial, the police swore under oath that I spoke uninhibitedly about the case, further incriminating myself. They lied, like gypsy storytellers. A murder charge, I thought. As helpless as I was, as downtrodden as I felt, my concern was more for my family, my mother and sisters. The shock and shame, the indelible stigma even when, or if, I could walk away from the nightmare clean. Occasionally, one of the officers would make a statement about the case, a statement hiding a question, trying to feel his way into my mood, 
trying to turn his sardonic face, the friendliness of a helping uncle, prying, prodding, wanting to make the time spent in the car rewarding. After what Tovar said, I knew I didn't dare give an answer. But at the time of the trial, it made no sense. It made no difference. Tovar would take the stand under oath and concoct false statements, claiming them to be my words. Besides, after his noble warning about the Miranda rights, he never did read them to me that morning. At the trial, of course, he said he had, and the three other officers backed him up. Who would the jury believe? You guessed it. My denial had less chance than a haystack and a cyclone. It was just before noon on the big wall clock in the first room we entered at Sir Mac Hospital, the jail's facility for arrestees. Dark and gloomy as a tomb, it was an eyesore, a real dump. If my dog had been hit by a car and this was the vet's office, I'd have to turn around and walk out with my whimpering dog. We gained admittance to what seemed to be an emergency room, with dried blood on the floor, paint peeling off the walls, and a foul odor. I was told to remove everything but my underwear. A doctor and some nurses entered the room, a couple of them cradling long information forms and steel-jacketed holders. The nurses recorded my answers to their medical queries, while the doctor checked my heart and lungs, and the nurse took my blood pressure. A steady stream of gawking employees came through, and a charade of working hospital staff, correction officers, a few authorized personnel and civvies, all unashamedly curious. I felt miniaturized, like something on a slide in the focus of many microscopes. These were staff people, but they were also curiosity seekers, media addicts, probably convinced of my guilt without second thoughts wanting a look at the person who had dominated the TV and radio and newspapers for the past 48 hours. It must have taken two or three hours before my examination was complete. And their examination was complete. On the third floor, in a spacious blue room containing two hospital beds, a shower, toilet, and sink, I sat on a bed and tiredly looked out the heavily screened window. California Avenue, Chicago. So this is it, my thought. I've read about it, heard about it, and here I am. <laughs> my view was of a fenced-in parking lot, and beyond that, a higher fence with rolled razor wire spiraling the long stretch of horizontal barbed wire that crowned the formidable wall. I'd never driven past it in my life. My first view was from the inside, looking out. A guard came in and handed me a white towel, a small bar of soap, and a roll of toilet paper. <clears throat> He told me I could take either bed and to come to the door of the room if I wanted anything, but not to step outside the door. These were the only civil words I'd heard in my recent past. Nothing ceremonious. Nothing especially courteous. Just humane. It seemed like hours passed, and during that time I had refused dinner. I looked at it, smelled it. I just couldn't eat it. I knew the next meal wouldn't look or smell any better. Eventually I'd have to eat, but it would be a Mexican standoff until I succumbed. 
About 10 p.m., a man in a white shirt came in and said they were going to move me because they didn't want me on the window side of the building. Although I could hear his voice, my mind was floating thoughtlessly, locking out the importance of my predicament. The room was not warm, but left alone a few minutes, I could tell how dull and fuzzy my thinking system was due to the residual drugs in my brain, my every body cell. I was in jail on a murder charge, and I didn't have the energy to fight or the ability to care. It was as if I had worked non-stop for 48 hours. The body is moving, but you can't feel a thing. He told me to gather the items they had given me and to follow him. I grabbed my soap, towel, and toilet paper and dragged myself after him down to the end of the hall. He unlocked a mammoth steel door and ushered me into a passage where there were two more doors just like the first one. He pointed me through the one on the left. There were no lights, no chairs, no toilet in the room. Only a steel bed bolted to the floor and the center of the room with barely enough space to walk around. At the far end, a heavy orange metal grate covered the window. My feet were cold and damp on the concrete floor. There was a small puddle of water under the bed. He left and locked the door behind him. A moment later, someone passed a blanket through the window and the door. I covered up my body, but it was still shivering, so I tucked into a fetal position on the thin, smelly mattress, which covered the cold steel bed frame. I couldn't understand why they didn't put me in the room across from and similar to the first one I occupied. And I thought I would never get any sleep in here. It seemed that every half hour a guard would unlock the outer steel door, walk up to the open window of my door, peek in with a flashlight, about face and walk back out, slam the heavy door, lock it and walk away. <clears throat> the echo would linger and the anticipation of his return kept me awake in a nervous waiting game. Sometime after midnight, I was found under the bed with the towel tied tightly around my neck, one end tied to the bed frame. I was lying in the puddle of water. How I got in that position is a mystery to me. I must have crashed out of bed, or either from a bad dream or the first stages of drug withdrawal. They thought I'd tried to kill myself. They untied me pulled me out and put me back on my mattress, tied spread eagle to the bed frame. When I complained about the cold, they threw the blanket over me. I was scared, cold and wet, but in spite of everything, fell into a deep sleep. I couldn't tell how long I was out. Once I had to go to the bathroom and yelled for two hours before someone untied me. When I was returned to the bed, I was again lashed securely. The Valiums were still working, and I quickly regained sleep. Late, either Sunday or Monday night, the door opened and my two attorneys appeared. An officer entered with them and untied one hand so I could twist over to my other side. They asked me how I felt. I told them I was freezing. Look at the way I'm being held, Sam. Can't you do something about this? He made a helpless face. There's no one around now, but I'll see what I could do tomorrow. Right now, I need you to sign some papers, giving me power of attorney so that I can act on your behalf. Just sign here, here, and here. Of course, I didn't know what I was signing. It could have been anything. I was too exhausted and bleary-eyed to be able to read. 
My throat was parched, and even talking took effort. Another paper, he said, was a predated resignation from me as street lighting secretary treasurer for the Cook County Board. He wanted to handle it as quietly as possible before the media got hold of it. I felt that was the right thing to do, so I signed everything they put in front of me, not knowing or reading anything. Again, I asked them to arrange better conditions for me. How can they rationalize tying down a man with a heart condition, especially when he is already under terrible stress? Are they nuts, Sam? This is going to stomp my heart. All he said was he had to go, and he would be back later. When? I yelled as he went out the door. And I got no answer. Impatiently, the guard asked if I needed the bathroom. When I said no, he strapped my wrist back down to the bed. I was shut back into semi-darkness with only a two-by-four of light slanting down through the small opening in the door. Again, the door slammed and echoed in my ears as he walked away. The only time I would see anyone was when they brought around medication or when they asked me if I wanted the latest meal. <laughs> I refused them all. The thought of the first one suppressed my hunger pangs. After what seemed like days, two officers came in, removed the straps and buckles, and helped me to my feet. I tried taking a step and stumbled, almost going down. My head whirled, probably more an after-effect of Valium abuse than the hunger, fatigue, or the night in straps. They led me around cautiously until I got my balance. My head slowly cleared. What day is it? He looked at me and said, December 26th, Tuesday night. Steadying me by my elbows, the two officers walked me out of the cold room to a rickety wooden bench set along the wall of the hallway. They sat me down on it some six feet in front of a small black and white portable TV with a slowly rolling picture. Beyond the TV was a glass wall that looked into a day room. Slow moving men wandered the hall aimlessly and thoughtlessly. They had the glazed eyes, the vacant look of men drugged into bewilderment. Some stopped in front of the TV and stared at, or through, me. One of the guards pointed to the area where the beds were located. Go sit on your beds. Go back to your rooms. I don't want you talking to this man. The men were not called by name. I doubt if they would have known my name if they had heard it. Their worlds were exclusive, private to themselves. I was allowed to sit there with an officer alongside for two hours. When it was time to return me to the isolated room for the night, a newly arrived guard asked me if I wanted to use the john. Then I was returned to the rancid bed and strapped securely. It was zero degree weather outside. The room's broken window was crusted with frost, and in the night, wind screamed against it. I slept as pulled together as possible. In the morning, I awoke with my stomach sore from violent shaking during the night. My first sight was the vapor of my breath. On the 28th of December, I would later learn that date, I heard my door being unlocked. Two guards entered claiming another picture of me was necessary because the one taken when I was booked into the hospital didn't develop clearly. Sit him up, one said to his partner. The second one stretched me lengthwise as best as he could and lifted my upper body into a slumped sitting position, squatting behind me, pushing on a, 
on the small of my back to keep my body from sagging and to keep himself out of the picture. Three fast shots of the camera. They told the guard at the door that was all they needed and left in a hurry. The following morning, one of those photos appeared on the front page of the Chicago Tribune. The shit hit the fan. My attorneys yelled foul. They called for an immediate investigation and demanded contempt charges be filed against Sheriff Elrod and that he be jailed. Elrod raised hell with, the war with Warden Hardeman, wanting to know how such a travesty of privacy and civil rights had taken place right under his nose. Finally, when the facts came out, it proved to be the greed of a jail guard that was behind the mess. The man had been a jail guard for 23 years. He had been approached by the Tribune and was paid $500 to obtain a unique photo of me. Being in the identification department, he had no problem passing through security. It cost him more than he was paid. Close to retirement, he was fired from his job and the defense filed charges against him for violating the protective order signed by Judge White which covered all in law enforcement and jail personnel working in the Cook County Sheriff's Department. Each time I saw my attorneys, they would stay, but a few minutes. They kept telling me that the reason I was being isolated and restrained was that the administration claimed I tried to kill myself that first night. I told Sam, They're crazy! Hell, I didn't even know where I was until the 26th of December, when an officer told me, if you, can't take, if you can't take care of this, I'll get someone who can. I'm freezing, tied down like an animal, and I can't eat in this position. Do something. All right, stay calm. I'll see what I can do. The preliminary hearing scheduled for December 29th had been canceled. The court citing as reasons, bomb and assassination threats. Even with the best security provisions death planes ever had, the court thought it best to reschedule the hearing until after the grand jury returned an indictment against me. On January 3rd, 1979, about noon, I was moved from that cold room to the room directly across from the one where I had been briefly put on the first day. For ten days I had lived on my back, strapped to a bed, spread eagle. For the last six days I had been allowed out of bed for two hours a day, to walk with an officer or sit and watch TV. The only other times I was out of bed was to use the toilet and once to shower. My attorneys arrived shortly after noon, their expression saying, Look what I did for you. I got you out of the back end and free of the straps. A tall, distinguished-looking black man walked in, extended his hand to me, and said, no, I'm Superintendent Patrick's. I'm in charge here, and I want to go over some rules that your attorneys and I have worked out for your security here. If at any time you have any questions, just have one of the officers now assigned to you, call me. He handed me three typed pages listing the rules I would have to follow. There were 27, there were 27 different restrictions and regulations listed. Who could visit me? Phone call rights? mail regulations, personal property allowances, areas of the jail to which I might have access, commissary items, etc. There would be nine correctional officers assigned to guard me, and they would have no other duties. They would sit at my door and allow no one to enter unless they were on the approved list. They were to have no conversation with me, nor allow me to talk to any other resident at any time. A log was to be kept and entries made every half hour around the clock. 
Any person entering the room had to be cleared by security, searched and entered into the log before visiting with me. My life was not my life anymore. It was a public display. If I farted, it would be entered into the logbook for future reference. <laughs>